Hey there, amazing audience who've joined the revolving time today. Get ready to embark on an unforgettable adventure with us. Subscribe now and let's uncover the hidden secrets and truths together. Life has a curious way of throwing unexpected curve balls our way, doesn't it? Well my friends, today's story is published by Massistasy. I caught my wife cheating at hotel, and then she tried to sneak out anyway. She always loved Target. She almost destroyed our marriage over Target. I hope you will enjoy this. My wife Letty was handcuffed to a stout kitchen chair. She looked the way I felt. I was ashamed to be using the handcuffs. She tried to run out on me, and I overreacted. The keys were upstairs and not handy. I would live with that decision for the time being. Her fancy makeup was ruined from crying. A vomit stain covered the left breast of her little black dress. The smell of partially digested wine and bile wafted over to where I was standing next to the sink. When Letty noticed I returned home early, she was so shocked and distressed that she immediately ran to the toilet to vomit. She didn't quite make it. While my wife was busy losing her lunch, I was rather shocked and distressed myself. That morning, she'd ostensibly departed for a trade show in Atlanta. Letty wasn't due to return until late Sunday evening. She kissed me goodbye at 7am and left for the four-hour drive to Atlanta. Mid-morning, a semi trying to make a tight turn clipped the electrical pole outside of my shop and brought it down. It caused a power outage. My cinderblock gun shop didn't have any windows by design, and it was pretty warm that day. Within an hour, we were all sweating our butts off in the dark, and my employees loudly demanded hazard pay. They were only half joking. We were still waiting for the electric co-op work crew when Letty called me. In her chipper sing-song tone, she said, Hey honey, I made it to Atlanta. Same hotel as last time. I'm sharing a room with one of the girls, and it's in her name. I'm at the convention center right now. We are putting the booth in order. We open at 2 p.m. After that, don't call me, I won't answer. I'll call you each night when I get relieved to go to dinner. Oops, got to run. Bye honey. A few minutes later, the electric co-op's work crew finally rolled up. Not long after, the crew boss stepped into my shop and reported that they brought the wrong size pole and it would be another three hours before they would restore the power. I closed the store and gave everyone Friday afternoon off. I drove straight home dreaming of a long cool shower. Imagine my surprise when I walked into my bedroom and Letty was standing there next to the bed. She was wearing the expensive lingerie set I bought her from a high-end boutique during our honeymoon. It was the one with the matching demi-cut bra, garter belt, and satin thong all in dark red. My wife only wore it for me a couple of times since I gave it to her seven years ago. My wife didn't see me walk in because she was shimmying her tight little black dress over her head. Letty was strangely unsteady on her feet. I have a sensitive nose and I smelled wine. I spotted an open bottle of Chardonnay on the dresser behind her. Next to it, in a small puddle of spilled wine, sat a glass with just a swallow or two remaining. I estimated that there was one heavy pour glass left in the bottle. That meant she drank at least three heavy pour glasses herself, which was heavy consumption for her. She was clearly aroused. When Letty is excited, her aroma reminds me of peach cobbler, warm from the oven. That smell filled my nostrils. In an instant, I took in that my wife was tipsy, turned on, and putting on her come duck me outfit. I got an immediate thrill that I was going to have a night to remember. This only lasted for a second before I remembered Letty was supposed to be in Atlanta right now. I instantly inferred she was getting ready to wear her CFM duds for someone else someone here in the county. When her dress popped down to reveal her face, her horrified reaction at seeing me was something I will never forget. My bride coughed out the word sorry, just as she started to heave. She bolted for the bathroom. Watching Letty vomit up most of a bottle of Chardonnay, along with the remains of her lunch, dispelled the possibility that she was planning a special surprise for me. Even as my heart sank and my universe crumbled, I couldn't look away from the spectacle of her curvaceous silhouette in a tight dress as she vomited. Her figure is that compelling. I was certain that Bowden Teague also felt her figure was compelling. 
Teague was the scumbag marketing director of Everpart, the car parts manufacturer where Liddy worked. When he put a few good-looking women on the exhibition booth floor in cute jeans and tight-fitting blouses, the traffic in the booth quintuples and the extra orders pour in. This put Letty solidly on his radar screen. A few years back, Teague brought in a van load of strippers to staff the booth. He referred to them as his booth candy. When Everparts HR and legal collectively found out, they had a Class 5 meltdown. Mr. Cope, the owner of Everpart, is shamefully indulgent of Teague, but even he couldn't overlook this violation. Mr. Cope now requires Teague to staff the booth only with full-time employees. Consequently, Teague recruits his booth candy from the available office staff. He asks Letty and a half dozen other shapely and good-looking women to man the floor at the trade show. The deal he worked out with Mr. Cope was that he calls his recruits volunteers and secretly pays them $1,000 in cash under under the table for every day they work. Nobody complains to management about wearing a tight blouse when they are receiving a grand of cash a day, tax-free just to talk with people. In her day job, Letty is an accountant a very good one. The irony was that she had to work almost a whole month at the office to make what she got on a single trade show weekend. It was an interesting demonstration of the law of supply and demand. I hated that Letty had to work at all, but we needed her salary to make ends meet. My father was a wealthy man when he passed away last year. Pa despised trust fund a holes and insisted that his kids would grow up knowing the meaning of a dollar. He set it up so that each of his kids had to start their own businesses and live off only what they earned until age 30. Only then would they be eligible to dip into their share of the family trust. My brother and sister, both several years older than me, had managed it and assured me that it was a worthwhile experience. They vowed to continue the tradition with their own children. As the youngest of Pa's children, I still had two years to go. Letty and I got by with a salary she earned and with what I could bring in from my gun shop. I know that the phrase my gun shop sounds lucrative. In rural Georgia, it isn't. The shop belonged to my Uncle Kevin and was more of a hobby business than a profitable concern. Uncle Kevin loved to hunt, and the shop gave him the opportunity to pick the brains of the best hunters in our part of the state. The shop was mine because Uncle Kevin had a stroke a couple of months before I graduated with a business degree from Georgia Tech. Rather than forcing me to start a new business from the ground up, as my brother and sister had, Pa gave me the option of taking over ownership of the store. The upside was that I didn't have to bootstrap a new business during an economic downturn when loans were nearly unobtainable. The downside was that there was limited growth potential. The day Letty's vomited on our bathroom floor, I owned the store for seven years and was the world's foremost expert in limited growth potential. I was inordinately proud. There were no missed paychecks for any of my five employees due to the cra asterisk PPY economy and the vagaries of COVID. I was certain I could make the shop a more profitable business with some capital improvements, but I couldn't qualify for the loans. I didn't have enough collateral to offset the risk and lending institutions were extremely risk averse when it came to financing firearm sales. Letty took the job at Everpart because they are the only company in the county big enough to need a full-time CPA. Consequently, Letty is extremely underpaid for her qualifications. Between Letty's salary and what I bring home from the store, we made ends meet. Truth be told, we were doing better than most in the county and we had nothing to complain about. However, when life threw its wrinkles at us, like when the hot water heater sprung a leak or the starter went out on my pickup, we tightened our belts and made do with less just like everyone else. Letty's trade show cash payouts made a huge difference to our quality of life. When Bowden Teague asked her if she wanted to work a show, she never refused. It took 10 minutes for me and Letty to clean her vomit from the bathroom floor. We worked quietly. Neither of us said a word. Letty didn't want to have to explain what she was doing at home getting dressed for another man. I didn't trust myself to contain my temper. I was usually slow to anger and sanguine, but on those rare occasions that I got really upset, I have real issues with self-control. Today was one of those occasions. I'd learned it was a lot easier to not lose my temper in the first place 
than it was to reel it in once I blew a gasket. I'd been working on that for years. When we were finished cleaning, I wanted to us go to the family room and calmly talk it out. Letty said that she had to get going, or she was going to be late. When I asked where she had to be, she closed her mouth and set her jaw. She can be incredibly stubborn. After 15 minutes of me asking increasingly hostile questions, all of which she refused to answer, she told me that she needed to go the restroom. I caught her two minutes later trying to sneak out to the garage, carrying a fresh dress on a hanger. She almost made it out the door without me noticing. That's when I overreacted. A few minutes later, she was handcuffed to a kitchen chair, and I was hoarse from screaming at her. The one good thing that came from this was that I finally had her full attention. She'd seen me lose my tempter, but had never been the object of it. She was physically safe my anger never included violence, but Letty didn't know that. I scared her half to death, which made me feel like a world-class sh asterisk at heel. The silver lining to handcuffing her to that chair was that she then understood she was going nowhere and had better talk. I asked her, where were you going? The answer better not be some bullsh asterisk it fake trade show in Atlanta. That's when she started crying. Update. Later, I asked her, of all people, you picked Bowden Teague. That man is a pig and you absolutely despise him. I do. I hate him. I can't stand him. I knew this was true. Letty's accounting responsibility covered Teague's marketing department. She had to interact with him on a weekly basis. He was decent to her, but she hated how he treated the rest of the women in the office. She practically danced in joy when one of the inventory supervisors reported him to HR for harassment. That wasn't his first accusation of harassment either. Mr. Cope placed Teague on probation. Teague should have been fired. But Mr. Cope thought he was a magician at marketing. Even though Teague kept his job, it was the last straw for his wife. She left him when she found out. She took their two young children with her. I asked, If you can't stand him, why the hell were you going over to his house? I wasn't going to his house. I was going to a hotel. Just answer the ducking question. Letty. I lost a bet. A bet? Yes, a bet. I bet him that Georgia would beat Clemson last week. Clemson won that game. Technically speaking, Clemson didn't just win the game. They also beat the spread a more than two touchdown spread. It wasn't a surprise because Georgia was in a rebuilding year. They lost five games prior to Clemson and were certifiably awful by typical Georgia standards. The story was finally starting to make sense. Letty has four older brothers. All five siblings were born around a year apart. Having four older brothers as rivals turned her into the most epic hyper-competitive trash talking female I'd ever met. Her given name was Violet, but she wasn't shrinking in any way she would get into a guy's face in a heartbeat. The more she hated someone, the more trash she talked. Thus, her family started calling her Letty instead. As a Georgia alum, she also liked to brag about, and apparently bet on, her precious bulldogs. That was a dangerous pastime for someone with nothing more than a casual interest in sports. What exactly were the stakes, Letty? She sobbed before she spoke. A trip to the British Virgin Islands. Ten days at an all-inclusive resort. And a dinner cruise on a sailboat. Bowden used to take his wife and kids there every year. I would get their trip in February for you and me. That was very high-stakes gambling for us. That's if he won. What if he won? The original stakes were that if he won, he would get me for an entire weekend. Get you for a weekend. What does that mean? I damn well knew what it meant. I wanted her to own it. Andy, it would mean that he would have me at his disposal. At his disposal to do what, Letty? Cook for him. Clean his toilets. Paint his house. She looked down and away from me. In a small voice, she said, to do anything he wanted to. You know, in the bedroom. Are you talking about love? She flushed red. Yes, Andy, meaning love. I took three full breaths before I asked in as mild a tone as I could manage. Letty, don't you think you should have led with the love angle? I'm ashamed, Andy. She started to tear up again. Before she could get going, I said, 
Let's back this up a bit. Earlier, you said original stakes? What does that mean? She really didn't want to answer that question. I started to lose control again. I let Letty get a good look at the anger building inside me. She started talking immediately. We went double or nothing. If I won, he'd also provide first-class airfare for two and two thousand in cash. And if he won, I'd do everything I said before, but also I'd have to agree to. She had a really hard time getting this next part out. I'd agree to take a different drug for him each day. He teases me about being Mrs. Goody Two Shoes. He said he wanted to see me cut loose and let my hair down. Drugs? Are you kidding me? He wanted to get you willingly doped up before you let him duck you. What drugs was he going to give you? Something called Molly tonight. I'm not sure what that is. A line of cocaine on Saturday. Marijuana on Sunday morning. That's all. He promised I'd be stone cold sober by Sunday afternoon. The hardest drug Letty ever ingested was a frozen margarita, and she didn't do that very often. I didn't want to ask this question, but I had to. Who won the original bet that led you into double or nothing? She said, I did. She had the BVI trip won, and then doubled down to get airline tickets and spending cash. She picked this year's down-cycle bulldogs on a bet with stakes of that magnitude. I put my hand over my face and stepped out onto the deck behind our house. Letty gambled her virtue, one, then doubled down. That was brutally hard to take. I had to walk around in the cool evening air for a few minutes before I could speak in a civil tongue again. When I came back inside, I said, You're not going anywhere. The bet is off. Your body belongs to me, and my body belongs to you. You can't wager something you don't own, just like I can't wager my Uncle Kevin's farm. Andy, I can't possibly Welsh. He tried to Welsh so many times, and I always call him out for it in front of his department. I roasted him and humiliated him. He'll do the same to me. How many bets is so many, Letty? 24. I've won 24 straight bets over the last two years. She was ridiculously proud of this. She told me about some of the bets. They were all top 20 teams going up against seller teams. Bowden always picked the seller team. Until the game last week. I asked. And then you lost the 25th bet. The one with stakes that included your fidelity to me and consumption of hard drugs. During this, you never once considered whether you were being set up. Why would I? That loser is so bad at betting. He'd never beaten me until last week. Letty, you were being set up. Every single team he bet on until the end was a guaranteed loser. He was deliberately losing. I was proud of how calmly I said that. I asked, what were the stakes to those 24 bets? She said, a Target gift card was our standard bet. $20 at first. $100 the last six or seven times. Target. She ducking loved Target. She almost destroyed our marriage over ducking Target. I poured out the rest of my beer and pulled the bourbon out of the cabinet above the fridge. I poured two fingers over a couple of ice cubes. While I did this, I replied, after 24 consecutive small dollar bets, which were easy to conceal from me, he suddenly raised the stakes to 10 days in an all-inclusive resort in the Caribbean. You weren't suspicious about that. Her eyes got big. She clearly hadn't looked at it that way. Bowden said that after his wife left him, he didn't want to go on their annual trip. He said he'd already paid for it, and it would be wasted otherwise. It made sense for him to use it in a bet. Wouldn't that be a reasonable explanation? It was obvious that Teague had caught Letty between the horns of her own ego and her own avarice. Her expression was self-explanatory. At least she had the decency to be abashed about it. I inquired, what was the cash value on that vacation? Enough that his wife would want to claim half of the value of it in her divorce action. Her non-answer was telling. I pressed on. Did you ever see the tickets? Or the booking confirmation? How did you know he even had the trip booked? Letty looked sick to her stomach when I asked this. Realization was dawning and my wife was finally starting to understand Teague's scheme. 
It was time to drive the point home the way Pa would have. Letty, have you considered what would have happened if you had spent the weekend doped up with the agreement that he could do anything he wanted to you? Her expression was puzzled. She clearly hadn't. She was thinking it would be like one of those nothing below the waist steamy romance novels she liked. The lovers languishing on a bed in an embrace after some unspoken activity described as passion, whispering sweetly about what their passion meant to them both. She wasn't thinking about what a degenerate like Teague would do. I said, the terms were anything he wants, right? Yes, Andy. Is there any kind of love you refuse to do? She blushed and looked at the floor. She answered, you know that there is. I said, the stakes you agreed to were that you couldn't refuse him things that you regularly refuse me. She looked utterly disgusted. I asked, what would prevent him from getting other people involved? What if he got you high on coke and then invited every one of those mini me scumbags he hired into the marketing department over for some complimentary action? You agreed to do that. Her expression turned to horror and she visibly shuddered. She started to cry. Heart. Suck it up, honey. There's one more. You aren't on birth control. The pills and the oud never agreed with you. We are very careful about what we do and when, and always use rubbers when you are most fertile. What if Bowden decided he preferred bareback? Your last period ended when? Two weeks ago. Wouldn't you be ovulating this weekend? What if breeding you with his child was what he wanted? You agreed to that? Letty suddenly started to retch. The handcuff keys were upstairs, so I whisked the kitchen trash can over to her. She leaned over it and sputtered a bit, but nothing came out. She was empty from before. From my wife's expression, I could tell that she finally understood with perfect clarity. She wept bitterly and said, I'm such a fool, Andy. I didn't want that. It never occurred to me that's what he was doing or what he could do. I was so certain I'd win. I was already planning what I would pack. I shouldn't have bet. When I lost, I should have told you. I should have known to Welsh. What was I thinking? She started blubbering. I sighed wearily. It was hard to believe, but my wife is actually an incredibly smart woman. Mr. Cope told me he nicknamed Letty the magician for the genius she had for making profits disappear from his ledgers. However, she was the youngest and only daughter in a family of seven. Her father had been the pastor at a small church, and her large and shockingly muscular brothers were fiercely protective. They scared away anyone that didn't hold Letty in as much esteem as they did. Very few had possessed the courage to run that gauntlet. Consequently, Letty had lived a sheltered small-town life before becoming engaged to me. Getting fooled this way was simple naivete. She was clueless about how awful humans could be to each other. Combine that with an almost terminal lack of imagination about love, and you will understand why a smart woman ended up in that situation. This was also her first exposure to truly high-stakes gambling. We both know that she is a thrill-seeker. I had kept her out of harm's way since we started dating. But I wasn't around this time, and she got carried away. Her entire face was covered with snot now. With her wrists handcuffed to the chair, she couldn't clean her own face. I gently wiped her face with a damp tea towel. It thought this would soothe her, but the effect was the opposite. Her blubbering got worse. I slapped the table and said, Letty, I need you to listen to me right now. Focus, please. Letty pulled herself back under control. I continued. This is instant divorce sh asterisk it right here. No lie. No exaggeration. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to divorce sh asterisk it. Do you understand that? Do you know how close I am to pulling the eject lever right now? Especially after I caught you and you tried to sneak out anyway. Letty nodded. Her mouth was tightly clenched to keep herself from crying. I said, I love you from the bottom of my heart, and I don't want to divorce you, but you've got to explain this sh asterisk it to me. When she didn't respond, I peppered her with questions. Are you bored with me? Have I disappointed you? Are you unsatisfied with me? Am I not good enough for you? How could you do this to us? 
Anguish spilled into my voice unbidden as I asked these questions. I cursed myself because it, I was raised to never indulge in self-pity. As hard as I tried, I couldn't keep it bottled in. I was certain my questions would make her cry again. Instead, they settled her. She responded fiercely. No, honey. No. This isn't you at all. You're the best man I've ever met. I'm totally satisfied, Andy. I want to be married to you. You are the man for me. Only you. I examined her face intently. She wasn't lying to me. She was telling me the truth. This is what made the situation so hard for me to understand. This is devastating, I said. I certainly hope you are telling the truth. You are going to have to do a lot of work to fix this. Before we got engaged, I told you my position on infidelity. I am one and done. The first time you do anything with another person, we are through. You understand that, right? Letty said. I feel the same way, if you ever. My anger flashed, and I interrupted her. Whoa, 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 nope. Don't you dare say it. Have I ever given you cause to doubt my fidelity? My wife shook her head. This incident was a major failure on your behalf, I continued. I have never failed like this. There is no moral equivalency between us. I've never took a misstep, but you. If I'd have come home a half hour later, you'd be well on your way to being Teague's whore asterisk E by now. There would be no stopping the divorce if that had happened. I have never put you in the position I am in now. I paused to settle myself down again. I noticed that my internal thoughts were circular and that I was starting to pump up my rage. I got a grip and forced myself to move forward. Did anyone witness the bet being made? I asked. Was anyone else in on a conversation about it at any time? Luddy shook her head. Then the only one who really knows your Welshing is him. Everyone else will think he's lying or exaggerating. Even if they knew the truth, it wouldn't matter. No one would expect you to put yourself through what he proposed. If Welshing makes you feel guilty, you're just going to have to live with the guilt. It is better to be a happily married Welsher, living with the shame of that, than it is to be an unhappy divorced Teague whore asterisk e living with ten times the shame. She held back a sob while nodding yes. She was in full agreement. I asked, How are you in contact with Teague? How did you set up this weekend? She said, We talked at the office. He wanted to text me on my cell phone, but I didn't want that, so I blocked him. Yesterday in the office, he gave me a burner phone, but I've never used it. Honest. Where is it? It's in my purse. I retrieved her purse from the utility room floor. There was a cheap pay-as-you-go phone in it. I asked, Is this it? She nodded. I went through the phone. There was one outgoing text which said, Test. There were several incoming texts from the last hour. Teague wanted to know what was taking so long. L asked her, Is there anything you need to tell me that we haven't covered? If I find out later, there is something else you are holding back. We're done. You know that right? She shook her head. That's all? You know it all? I said, Okay then. Please. Pretty please, can I take those handcuffs off you now? Are you in any danger of trying to slip out on me again? No last second impulsive change of mind. With surprising fierceness, she said, I'm not going anywhere, Andy. You're my man. I will do what you say. I'm not going anywhere. I went upstairs and retrieved the handcuff key. With a silent prayer, I let her go. She made an attempt to suffocate me with kissing. I really didn't want to kiss her right now. Between the anger, the snot residue, and the vomit smell, I was utterly turned off. Even so, she was persuasive. After a breathless minute, I pushed her away and sent her up to shower and brush her teeth. I told her, no contact with Teague for any reason. We need to regroup. She agreed. As she walked past me, I touched her arm to stop her. Letty, I love that lingerie set on you. Do me a favor and take a selfie in the bathroom mirror with that lingerie set. Do it for me. She smiled and nodded. Update 1. While she showered and cleaned up, I drove down to Lonnie's barbecue, which is a half mile from the house. I got a couple of takeout plates, 
fried chicken and pulled pork with several sides. This was our comfort meal. It was early for dinner yet, but I thought the food would help. While I was waiting, my phone buzzed. Letty had texted me her selfie. She had pulled her hair back into a ponytail, cleaned her face up, and reapplied her eye makeup the way that I loved. She knew exactly how to push my buttons. The photo took my breath away. To think how close we were to disaster that night filled me with a barely contained rage. I wanted my pound of flesh from Teague for this. I considered how to get it without getting myself thrown in prison. That's when it occurred to me that if I got Letty's brothers involved, I probably wouldn't have to do anything. As we were eating, I said to Letty, I know you're sensitive about the way your brothers tease you. I'm going to do what I can to keep this little incident just between us. Neither my family nor yours need to know. Her expression told me that she was absurdly grateful. I continued, but you and I both know that we need to do something about Bowden Teague. What he did was seriously predatory. If we don't do something, he'll go after someone else. Someone without our resources. Someone who can't fight back. We need to be responsible. We need to be the adults in the room. She nodded and said, I want him to face justice for what he did. I asked her, What does justice mean to you? I'm not sure he broke any laws with what he did to you, buddy. Doing what he did to get you to sleep with him was contemptible, but it wasn't illegal. She didn't say anything for a while. I said, We do have something we can work with. He's holed up in a hotel room with drugs. That is illegal and might be enough to get him arrested. To do something along those lines, we'll have to bring either W.C. or Little Joe into the picture. She groaned in dismay. I said, now, Little Joe won't be afraid to bend the rules. W.C. will do it all by the book. I'd rather use W.C. because he's a lot more likely to keep his trap shut. Plus, he's been after me to borrow Pa's vintage ski boat to take Newt and Rascal Tubing. I can try to buy his silence with that. What Little Joe has going for him is guaranteed results. He'll make sure Bowden is stopped, whatever it takes. I'll let you make the decision. She summoned her courage and said, Go with W.C. I don't trust Little Joe to keep his mouth shut either. I called up W.C. He answered on the first ring. Andy, how are you and my beautiful sister doing? I said, Not so great, W.C. Are you on duty tonight? You aren't? Good. I'm going to need a big favor from you. I'll owe you big time for this one. Twenty minutes later, a sheriff's department SUV pulled into our driveway. W.C. is Letty's oldest brother and the scariest of the four. As the lead deputy sheriff for the county, W.C. has a pretty big responsibility. In our state, sheriffs are politicians and don't need to have a law enforcement background. The lead deputy is the person who was the top law enforcement professional, the one who knows how to do the job and run the department while the sheriff does political stuff and works with the commissioner and the public. W.C. is the lead deputy for our county and manages the job superbly. Unlike his predecessor, he has earned the respect of the minority communities. The old-timers around town were predicting that after the current sheriff retires, W.C. will be the county sheriff for the next 20 years. I filled in W.C. about what was going on with Letty and Bowden Teague. To spare Letty the humiliation, I did all the talking. At first, W.C. was highly amused at his sister's gullibility. You went double or nothing on Georgia against Clemson this year? Cripes a mighty. That was bag of hammers stupid, exclaimed W.C. As I went on to describe the setup and the drugs. However, his jovial mood went sour. He became angrier and angrier. When W.C. gets angry, he doesn't lose control like I do. His lips go tight and his eyes glow. That's what makes him so damn scary. I said. That as asterisk hole is over at the garden in in room 223. He's supposed to have the drugs with him there. Is there some sort of pretense you can use to search his room? Maybe you could use a canine to sniff him out. WC said he had a few ideas and went out to his SUV to make some phone calls in private. He came back and smiling. He said, good news. An anonymous tipper just dialed 911 from a house phone at the Garden Inn. 
The tipper said they'd overheard the guy in room 223 at the garden and buying drugs from a dealer. If the door is open when my guys get there, then we have all the cover they need to do a search legally. He asked Letty. Can you pretend you're going over there and ask him to leave the door open for you? Bowden Teague had been calling the burner phone every few minutes for the last hour and was leaving voicemails. He was impatient to know when she'd be arriving. I handed her the burner phone and said, Text him, Letty. Tell him you're in the parking lot, but you're nervous about being seen standing in the hall waiting for the door to open. Ask him to leave it open so you can dart right in. She typed out a text and sent it. Teague didn't answer the question. He texted back. Where have you been? Her phone immediately rang. I told her not to answer. She would probably give us away if she talked to him. I said, text him back. Tell him that I showed up unexpectedly and that it took a while for you to ditch me. Teague responded. If you want that door open, you need to make it worth my while. Letty asked. What should I do? I had a sudden inspiration. On my cell phone, I took the selfie Letty took of her lingerie set in the bathroom mirror. I carefully cropped it so that he could see from the top of her bra to the top of her stockings. I sent it to the burner phone using Bluetooth. I had Letty text it to him. The close-up of her lingerie was revealing, but it wasn't personally identifying. The picture was enough to make a man lose his mind. Bowden's response was immediate. He texted back, Best weekend ever. A second later, Teague texted an image of a wide-open hotel room door, taken from the inside. WC made a phone call to get the ball rolling and then sat down in the living room with me. I sent Letty upstairs for a few minutes on a pretext. When she left, I asked WC to take it easy on Letty. I know I already owe you big time for this, but Letty's really sensitive about being cozen. She's a bright woman, but she's naive and sheltered and was fished in. I know you've been dying to borrow the boat I inherited from my pa. If you keep this between the three of us, I'll let you use it a weekend a month for the rest of the year. You choose which weekends. I'll even keep it gassed up for you. WC laughed and said, Andy, you don't owe me squat. You acted to protect my sister. I expected that of you or I never would have let you date her. Even so, I'm grateful. What you are asking me to do is literally my job. Busting him is the least I can do. As far as keeping it myself, I love little Joe, but you know how his tongue wags at both ends. If he ever found out what happened to Letty, the whole county would know by noon the next day. He'd never let her live it down, and that's a fact. Credit me for having some judgment and discretion. I agreed and apologized for any negative implications. He smiled and declared. That being said, I do want to borrow your boat. Your father's vintage ski boat one time is plenty. Sometime in June would be nice, after school is out, and I can take the kids on a weekday. The gas is on me. We shook on it. Update 2. Letty came down and visited with her brother while we waited. Letty was dying to have kids. We decided to put it off until we had access to the trust. My sister had waited and my brother hadn't. Both recommended that we wait. Letty got her motherhood fix by doting on our many nieces and nephews. She gave W.C. the third degree on what was going on with his kids. Newt and Rascal were her favorite niece and nephew. W.C. eventually received a phone call. In a couple of places, he laughed, but without saying much. After a couple of minutes of listening, W.C. said, Outstanding. Good work, Darnell. Thank Carlos for me too. W.C. reported to us, Bowden Teague was arrested a few minutes ago at the Garden Inn on charges of drug possession with intent to distribute. They ended up with two joints, one of which was partly smoked. That is simple possession, and the prosecutor probably won't proffer charges on that. We got lucky on the cocaine. He had a non-trivial quantity, empty baggies, and a scale. That's prima facie intent to distribute. He's going to get prison time for that for sure. He also had meth pills. We didn't find any Molly. My guess is that he was going to give you meth and then tell you that was Molly. Letty, you don't want to have anything do with with meth. Not only is it highly addictive, 
It removes lovule inhibition. I struggled to keep my temper in check. Letty ran her hand up and down my back soothingly. WC continued. The probable cause with the anonymous tip was a little thin, but Bowden did himself in. He was smoking dope in the room when the deputies walked by. The door was open so the deputies smelled the smoke and stepped inside. Teague tried to push them out. In the scuffle, he dropped a baggie containing cocaine in the hall right in front of four witnesses, including the hotel manager and the on-call maintenance guy. He became belligerent and resisted after that. The deputies had to subdue him with a taser. He said, The arresting officer was Darnell Billups. He's the one that used the taser. Do you know Darnell? He was a regular customer in my shop, so I nodded. Letty shook her head. WC continued. Bowden was two years ahead of me in school, and back then his father was in the state legislature. He went to college four years before you got to high school, so you didn't know him. In high school, he used to subject the black kids to a bunch of racist SH asterisk it. It took 15 years, but Darnell finally got some payback for that. Darnell told me, there's nothing like making some racist piece of SH asterisk. It do the electric slide in front of witnesses, who will testify that I was just doing my duty. Darnell promised to treat me and my wife to a steak dinner for sending him on that call. We shared a pretty good laugh over that. Darnell's father had been a diesel mechanic who worked for Pop. He floated between the various dealerships depending on the repair work to be done. Darnell's folks were good people. Pa raised me to respect good people. I was glad he got some payback. Letty asked, What will happen to Bowden? WC said, Do you know Laney Wilcox? He's the county prosecutor. He turns a blind eye to pot, but he is merciless on cocaine and meth. Intent to distribute has mandatory sentencing. Unless I miss my guess, he'll make an example out of Mr. Teague. He looked at Letty. Darnell was able to palm Teague's cell phone. Is there anything on that phone that you'd be embarrassed about? Texts, emails, calls, or pictures? Letty said, Only that one picture we just sent. We called each other a couple of times over the last two years when we were at trade shows and were talking floor schedules. That was it. I want that picture gone, WC. WC said, That is already taken care of. As they clean up the scene, Teague's phone will be found broken and will be logged as damaged during the scuffle. You owe Darnell for that. Darnell bought a couple of boxes of 9mm ammunition a month from me and a pallet of 12-gauge shells in the late summer. He kept a running tab and paid it down with regular payments over the year. I made a mental note that this year's tab would be on the house. He also came in once a month or so on the lookout for a good deal on a shotgun for his oldest son. I'd taken in a Remington 870 Wingmaster in good condition on a trade a few days ago. I'd offer him a pretty good deal on it. I got Darnell covered, I said and left it at that. WC nodded in understanding. Letty asked WC, What if Bowden says he was in the room waiting on me? Bowden said, He won't. He was arrested in possession of narcotics. He's smart enough to know that no one would believe him. Secondly, there's nothing to trace you to him except for the burner phone. His phone is broken. If he raises a stink about the broken phone, we'll get a warrant to examine the online backups, and he screws himself. Darnell took a good look at his cell phone, and the most recent texts are mostly from Teague's dealer. There is a history of incriminating transactions. It is unlikely Teague will say anything that might draw attention to the phone. As for you, there is no evidence that you ever possessed the burner phone. I'll take it and lose it for you. Letty asked. Can't they trace the burner phone to this house? WC said. A determined investigator could get the records from the cell company and triangulate the phone. In a big city, they could probably pin it down to between a half mile to a quarter mile radius. Out here in the country, we don't have nearly as many towers. They'd only be able to narrow it down to an eight-mile radius. There are a hundred houses within eight miles of here, so the answer is not really. If all else fails, I would be managing the investigation. WC looked at both of us. He said, There's one more thing you need to know. While they were searching the room, 
They found some pretty fancy camera equipment set up. The kind of camera that's inconspicuous but has high resolution. One was on top of the curtain rod. The other was placed on the dresser. The deputies wouldn't have noticed them if they weren't looking for them. They were both running when the deputies stepped into the room. He had coke, meth, and running blackmail cameras. Do I need to draw you a picture on how you were being set up? Think past yourself on this, Letty. Your husband's family is known to be wealthy. He may have been the target and not you. What could Teague have done to Andy with incriminating blackmail material on you? Her face went white. She said nothing. Nothing to say. Good. You dodged a bullet, sis. WC asked to speak with Letty privately. I stepped into the entry hall to give them the room. I looked at them while he whispered at her. As he did so, Letty made eye contact with me and began to cry again. It was too much for me to take. I looked away. When WC went to leave, I thanked him profusely. But WC shrugged it off like it was nothing. Families down here take care of each other. Update 3 Later that evening, I asked Letty what WC said to her. She said, He told me that if I ever did to you what mother did to us, I'd better pack up and leave the county, or he'd tie me to the whipping post himself and make me weep in sorrow. It scared the SH asterisk it out of me Andy. I've never seen my brother angrier at anyone. This was a reference to the fact that Letty's mom Loretta had run off a man when Letty and her brothers were children. The man happened to be Pa's lawyer. When I was a kid, my father owned a string of small car dealerships across South Georgia. He had a passel of lawyers working for him out of a partnership in Augusta. One of the lawyers drove down every week to meet with Pa on routine business. On each of those trips, the lawyer stopped and ate lunch at the diner where Loretta worked as a lunch waitress. She had to work there to help her family make ends meet. Letty's family was very respectable but poor. Country preachers like Letty's dad never have much money. Loretta was beautiful, and Pa's lawyer took a shine to her. She struggled with her lot in life. The lawyer was a good-looking man and a smooth talker. Over time, he slowly seduced Loretta into leaving her family for him. He promised her a life of ease and luxury in the big city of Augusta. He even told her the kids could come join them after a year or two. That was all it took for Loretta to decide to run off with him. Letty's father Roy was devastated by this and lost his position at the church over the scandal. Paul was furious. The lawyer was his employee that he brought into town and he felt personally responsible. Pa fired the lawyer immediately. The day that the deacons at Roy's church asked Roy to resign, my father hired him to be the sales manager at his Ford and Lincoln dealership. It was a substantial pay raise from preaching. Pa was trying to stand behind Roy and make a statement to the community. It worked, but it also had an unintended consequence. It was the single best business decision Pa ever made. Roy had a reputation for honesty and respect, and he sold a lot of cars for Pa. Under Roy's direction, that Ford dealership became the cornerstone of Pa's business empire. Over the next few years, Pa and Roy became unlikely best friends. The hard as asterisk businessman that everyone feared and the discredited preacher that everyone loved. Roy could not cook and his kids believed their father was capable of burning water. The thought of his five growing kids eating frozen dinners every night worked on Ma's conscience terribly. So Roy's family were regular guests to Sunday dinner. Ma was traditional and made it a point to spend time with Letty to make sure she learned how to cook. Being the only girl, Letty missed her mom and was hungry for the mothering and attention. She and Ma possessed the same sense of humor and could make each other laugh for hours on end. Letty and Ma would spend hours every Sunday afternoon cooking and laughing. I first realized I was in love with Letty when I was sitting at our kitchen table on a Sunday afternoon, watching her gently knead biscuit dough. She had a smudge of flour right in the tip of her nose. She was saying something antically that made my mom laugh so hard she was hooting and could barely stand. As my mom laughed, Letty looked over at me, winked, and smiled as if to say, Isn't your mom amazing? My heart beat wildly in my chest at that moment. I felt giddy and lighter than air. I was 15 and Letty was 14. She was an early bloomer, 
and was the prettiest thing I'd ever seen. I still remember with perfect clarity what that moment felt like. It was the best feeling in the world. WC was the first one to spot how I felt about Letty. Not long after that Sunday, he pulled me aside for a little chat. WC was four years older than me, and at that point, he had six inches and 80 pounds on me. He told me, I know you're in love with Letty, Andy. It's written all over your face. My sister is trying to hide it too, but she feels just as strongly about you as you do about her. I'll make you a deal. As long as you treat her with respect, I'll run interference with my father and my brothers and keep them off of your back. I'm a pretty good judge of character and I think that you'll take care of her. This is my expectation. You will take care of her. Don't disappointment me, Andy. At the time, I thought he was being uncommonly magnanimous. Years later, I realized that WC would have moved heaven and earth for me. My parents stepped up to help Letty's family and give them dignity and respectability. Pa and Ma came through for them when they most needed it. WC was pretty intelligent and understood what that meant to his family. Pa was a vindictive man. Months after he fired the lawyer, he was still Pi asterisk S said. He spared no expense or resource in making sure the lawyer regretted his decision to talk Loretta into running off with him. Pa hired the best investigators in the state. The investigators accumulated a treasure trove of dirt on the lawyer and used it to slowly grind the him into dust. In a single three-month period, the lawyer lost several cases, his partnership, his law license, his wealth, his house, and last of all, Loretta. All Pa did was leak the right piece of dirt to the right person at the right time. When word got back to Roy what had happened to the lawyer, he dropped by our house to visit. I overheard him tell Pa Fa, Proverbs 21:15 says, The exercise of justice is joy for the righteous, but terror to those who practice injustice. It is good to know that I have friends that the Lord uses to administer justice. Pa shrugged it off like it was nothing. Families down here look after each other. Update 4. A few months after Teague was arrested, WC dropped by on my day off to chat with me. He said that there had been an incident at Glenville State Prison and that Bowden Teague was dead. I asked WC what happened. He told me that after Teague took a plea deal for the minimum mandatory time, the state shipped him to Glenville. The first week he was incarcerated there, Teague took a shank to the neck in the shower and bled out in front of a hundred inmates. The shank could have been wielded by any one of the hundred witnesses, and no one was talking. He said the warden contacted the sheriff to find out if anyone in the county might have it in for Teague. The warden told the sheriff that the rumor mill in the prison said that a few years back, Teague had met a young Hispanic woman working in a bar, got her strung out on meth, and ruined her marriage. The rumor mill said that the family found out he was in Glenville and paid a notorious Central American gang to exact revenge. The sheriff asked WC to look into it and then call the warden back. I asked, what did you tell the warden? He said very carefully, I looked into it and didn't find anything. Hypothetically speaking, if I did know who the family was, I probably wouldn't tell the warden who they were. The family would be under suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder. That's a very serious charge, which would be expensive to fight legally. The family might not have been involved in the first place. It was just a prison yard rumor, after all. Mind you, even if the rumor was true, the individual who told the family that Teague was in Glenville wouldn't be guilty of anything. Teague's incarceration was a matter of public record. The person would just be bringing it to their attention. I responded by telling him the story about overhearing his father quoting Proverbs to Pa. He never heard that story and was surprised. I looked into his face to see if he understood my meaning. When I was certain he did, I said, It is good to know that I have friends too. WC smiled broadly at that and punched me on the shoulder. He said, I'm glad we understand each other so clearly, Andy. Letty couldn't have picked a better man. In the week after I caught her, Letty and I tried to have love a half dozen times. I was still so pie asterisk s set off. I had problems performing. That had never happened to me before, and it was completely demoralizing. As soon as it came time for penetration, I went as limp as a noodle. Letty saw it as rejection, 
and would cry disconsolately for hours afterwards. That didn't help me much either. I decided to see my doctor about it. The doctor declared me physically fit and sent me to a psychologist. The counselor he recommended was an older hippy dippy lady named Meadow Zarana. Her office is in Macon. I really liked Meadow. She is earthy, worldly, and has a sense of humor about the situation that I found refreshing. I told her the story of what happened using humor and irony to take the sting off of it. She laughed in all the places I would if someone was telling me the story that way. She had a phenomenal full-body laugh. She worked with me twice a week for a couple of months to help me deal constructively with my anger. When I learned how to channel my anger effectively, my function came back. However, my lovemaking with Letty was stilted and awkward. My trust of her was still in the toilet. I'd treated my symptoms, but hadn't addressed the underlying problem. Letty was cautiously supportive when I set up couples counseling with Meadow. Meadow started the couples counseling by having us share our goals. My goals were surprisingly different from Letty's. I said, My goal is to get over my anger and feelings of betrayal. I want to restore our trust to what we had before I came home early that day. Letty said, My goal is that I want to know if I'm just that ducking stupid. Seriously, that's exactly what she told the counselor. Meadow was fit to bust when Letty said that. She laughed so hard that she couldn't speak. She laughed for almost a full minute when she suddenly stopped laughing, sat up, and said, Oops, damn it Letty, you made me pee myself. She ran to the bathroom. The antic way it was done made Letty and I laugh uproariously. It was therapeutic. For the first time in a long time I relaxed around Letty. I put my hand in hers. She beamed at me for the first time in weeks. Update 5 Meadow was surprisingly effective at helping us. Even so, it wasn't easy. I cannot imagine how much more difficult it would have been if Letty had made it to Teague's hotel room, even for just a few minutes. I frequently thank my lucky stars that I caught her just before she left. We went in circles for the first three sessions. The thing that most bothered me was that Letty had clearly been aroused over the prospect of being lovely used by a man that I knew she despised. The narratives that came to mind when contemplated why she reacted that way led me to a very dark place. Letty, for her part, repeatedly denied she had been aroused at all. This was particularly maddening because it was so physically obvious. Meadow and I had discussed this ad nauseum in our individual sessions, and she knew that this was my major issue. In the fourth counseling session, Hippy Dippy Meadow finally had enough of Letty's dissembling and cunningly tricked her into admitting her arousal. Upon Letty's admission, she broke down and cried. After she pulled herself together, Meadow spent the rest of the session exploring how Letty's arousal made me feel. I think Letty understood for the first time the depth of my feelings and the insecurity I was dealing with. She came out of that session grimly determined to help me understand her actions and regain confidence in her. The next month of sessions were between Letty and Meadow alone. When we returned to doing couples sessions, Meadow surprised me with the first question. She restated the terms of the bet, and then she asked me if I'd ever wanted that same deal from Letty. I replied directly to Letty. I would have loved having the same deal as Teague, minus the drug, of course. There's so much stuff I've always wanted to try with you, but you wouldn't allow it. You even refused to try things you'd obviously enjoy. I'd give anything to have you serving as my slave, able to do with you as I would please. Hell yes, all day, every day. Letty looked at me with shock and surprise. I asked her rhetorically, how on earth is it possible that you have no idea that's how I felt about you? My wife went beat red. She said, I come from such a conservative background, Andy. I... Letty drifted off rather than finish the thought. Meadow saw her discomfort and said, Letty, remember what we talked about? You need to be honest and straightforward. You should tell him about the phone call. He should know. I waited patiently for my wife to speak. She gathered herself and said, Just before my mother left us, I came home from school early one day. Softball practice had been cancelled that day, so I was home early. When I got home, I overheard my mom talking on the phone. 
She was giddy with excitement while talking very explicitly about love. She used words like tool and poo hash ssy and was clearly engaged in some sort of foam love thing. I thought she was talking to daddy and I was shocked. It was a side of my parents that I'd never seen before. I was both grossed out and fascinated. A week later, mom left us. When I came home from school, I expected daddy to be home, but he'd been called out for a hospital visit. Because of the visit, I was the one who found the note she left on the kitchen table. The note was for my father, but I read it. In the letter, mom said my father had never provided her a reasonable standard of living or satisfied her lovely, and she was moving on with someone who could do both. Meadow cut me off with a gesture and gave me an exasperated look as if I was a particularly dense student. Andy, you asked me if this was a real thing, not whether it made sense or whether it was logical. I know it sounds outrageous to you, but avoidance of guilt via externalizing the locus of control is surprisingly common. It is hypothesized to be one of the reasons why submissive love your relationships are attractive to a surprising percentage of the population. I considered this and then asked Meadow, Do you believe Letty? Meadow replied, Letty and I discussed this extensively, Andy. I'm quite convinced that she is telling the truth. More importantly, I do not believe that she is hiding a motive other than the one she stated. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter what I think. This is something that you must decide for yourself. Letty was looking at me intently with worry written all over her face. She was waiting for me to say something. I looked at Meadow, and she was too. Confused, I inquired. Was there a question in there for me? Did I miss it? Meadow said. For several sessions, you have wanted an explanation from Letty as to why she was so aroused when preparing to go to the hotel with Teague. She gave it to you just now. Do you accept her explanation? So this was it. It was the brass tax, as Pa used to say. Did I believe Letty and Meadow? I spoke to Letty directly. Letty, when we married, I promised you that I would be faithful for the rest of my life. I wasn't forced into that. I chose to make that promise because I loved you. You were and are amazing, attractive, and desirable. When I made that promise to be faithful, we had fooled around some, but I respected your desire to go to the altar as a virgin. I know I have a very strong libido and I was afraid yours wouldn't match mine. My hope and my prayer was we were in sync. When I saw you at times cutting loose at times, I'm ride or die. Take me, Andy. I stood her up and followed her to the bedroom. She was so turned on. Update 6. For the next year, not a single a day went by when I wasn't literally inside of her one way or another. I made sure we did something every day. Even if we were tired or cranky, or had a lot going on, I made it happen. She stuck to her commitment to never refuse anything. I honored her attitude by easing her into it. For the first couple of months, we focused on getting Letty get accustomed to what she termed full access. She was conventional and conservative, and it took her a bit to relax into all the stuff that I wanted to try. Within six months, we'd exhausted my bucket list. I'd done everything I could think about. When I admitted that to Letty, to my surprise, she asked me to push our boundaries more. I went back to Meadow and asked for some advice on how to do that. She did some research and gave me a surprisingly comprehensive list of activities to try. I'd never even heard of half of them and my Google search history would have made a French street whore asterisk e blush with shame. She also advised me to task Letty with doing her own research. I had her look over online sites and send me links to stories she found stimulating. We found a dozen things to try that way. When she gave me her list, Meadow also gave me a piece advice that I took to heart. She said, Remember that what excites her, what she wants to do, and what she is willing to do are three separate lists. Just because something turns her on doesn't mean that's what she actually wants to do. Even if she actually wants to do it, it doesn't mean that she will do it. Understand. Women commonly have fantasies about love with strangers, group love and other things like that. Very few of those women would ever really consider doing any of it. Just because something turns Letty on doesn't mean she is on the prowl for it. If you decide to deep dive like this, don't stare into the abyss to try to figure out why something turns her on. 
Just accept that it does and use it to bring her pleasure. I know Letty well enough to know that, at the end of the day, you're the only one she's really thinking about. You should know that too. Later that week, using Meadows' list, we tried a lot of things that most conventional couples have never considered. We enjoyed most of them, and we found a few really unexpected wrinkles in what turned her on. One day, I decide that we'd try something that would be unconventional in almost anyone's book. It didn't do much for me at all. Letty, however, went wild. She asked, Where did that come from? Good luck finding another woman who will come that hard from doing that. She meant it as a joke. But after she said it, she got a profound look on her face. She said, I never would have done that if you didn't tell me to do it. And look at how I responded. That orga was magnificent. Do you see? Now, what I was saying back in Meadow's office. The lack of guilt allowed me the liberty to enjoy the perverse. I think I made my own case tonight. I agreed. Final update. It was an amazing year. Our Love Yule relationship had a renaissance. The Love Yule experimentation, the submission, and daily diet of love suited her. For the first time since I'd known her, she didn't have even one down week all year. She was happier, less cranky, and was far less anxious. She knew I was happy and that I loved her in a way that greatly boosted her confidence. The daily diet of love was great for me. I walked around like I owned the ground I walked on. A lot of what I do at the gun shop involves negotiation. I stopped trying to channel pause hard as asterisk businessman persona and relaxed around customers. I learned that when customers saw I was negotiating in good faith and not trying to shark them, they had an easier time saying yes to a good deal. The old aphorism is true. Confidence closes negotiations. I was absolutely killing it at work. Our shop turned a corner financially. I received three separate buyout offers from other shops in our part of the state. They were all lucrative, but I held on to the business for the sake of my employees. I'd kept all of the offers very close to my vest, but somehow word leaked out anyway. J.D. Butler, the county commissioner, dropped by my shop one afternoon and said, Andy, I heard you turned down a buyout offer from J. Crown Tactical up in Macon. Is that true? I admitted it was and said, It was a pretty penny, but I couldn't bring myself to accept. We love the county, Mr. Butler. I don't think I could pry Letty away from here with a crowbar. He said, I got to admit, when I heard you went to school up in Atlanta, I didn't ever think you'd come back home. I figured you'd disappear into the wilds of Atlanta like your brother and sister did. Instead, you surprised us all by coming home, and you have clearly committed yourself to the future of the county. I'm proud of you, son. That's why I wanted to stop by to talk turkey about a business deal I've got going on. JD was negotiating to buy out of the remaining businesses in the main street area in the county seat and redevelop the area. The old buildings on that street were magnificent brick-built structures with enormous windows, wood floors, and spoke of a prosperous age gone by. With a little bit of TLC, those buildings would still be magnificent in a hundred years. JD's son, Tyler, who had been off in Atlanta as a sous chef at a Michelin three-star bistro, was tired of city life and his wife was pregnant. He decided to come home to the county to open up a farm-to-table restaurant in the county. Tyler was going to capitalize on trend of day trip voyagers coming out of Augusta and Atlanta, looking for a taste of country life. Lonnie, owner of Lonnie's Barbecue, was going to relocate his restaurant two doors down from Tyler's restaurant and was partnering with his niece to set up a high-end coffee, pastry, and ice cream shop. The Howard family was going to convert the old supermarket into an old-timey five and dime. JD wanted me to move my shop into the old farmer's bank building. Part of Uncle Kevin's store was a display cabinet of the guns that won the West. JD thought it would give the city slickers something exciting and rustic to gawk at while they were waiting for their tables. At first, I was very skeptical. One of the things that made the gun shop profitable was that we didn't have to pay rent or a mortgage on a building. In the back of my head, however, I knew that the shop's main weakness was that it was out in the boonies. I knew we'd get more traffic if we were centrally located and had better parking. What sold me on the idea was when JD walked me through the old bank. 
It was a mason-built building from a different era that gave it a sense of gravitas. The fixtures were all brass. The teller counter would be perfect for floor sales. And the enormous 30s-era vault was still in perfect working order. The merchandise could be stored there with little risk of theft. The county had assumed ownership on the bank for default on taxes. I could purchase the building for what was owed in taxes if I agreed to run the store in the building for 10 years. The amount of taxes was 30% of the assessed value of the building. I talked it over with Letty, my employees, and my siblings. We didn't see a downside. My sister, who managed the family trust, allowed me early access to borrow money against my future share of the trust. I bought the bank building and moved my store there. It was the best business decision I ever made. As part of what Meadow calls trust work, Letty and I worked hard to be a lot more open and transparent with each other about what was going on in our heads and away from home. We went through a series of questions every night that forced us to expose our secrets. Using the list, we learned how to talk about things that were uncomfortable topics for us. I gave everyone Black Friday off Otha so they could spend a longer Thanksgiving weekend with their families. I was at the shop alone. Florence Benson, an old high school friend, dropped by the shop for a chat. In high school, Florence was an insecure skinny blonde who was your proverbial late bloomer. For a period of time in high school, Florence was Letty's main rival for my affection. As a grown woman, Florence had grown into an archetypical blonde bombshell. Think Kate Hudson with a friendlier smile. We had a great time catching up. She went away to Carnegie Mellon to study, of all things, musical theater. Apparently, she grew into her adult body in her freshman year and was quite successful there. She just finished a 24-month run as a performer for Wicked on Broadway. First as a swing performer, then later as an understudy to Glinda. Most recently, she was cast in the role of Elphaba in the Wicked Traveling production. She returned home for Thanksgiving to spend time with her family because she knew she wouldn't get to see them for a while once she went on the road. Around 4 p.m., I invited Florence to come eat dinner with Letty and me. She politely declined and surprised me by propositioning me for love. She told me that for years, she thought of me as was the one that got away. She promised she would be discreet and that no one in the county would ever know. I'm ashamed to say that I was incredibly tempted. Florence was smart, talented, beautiful, and her grown-up body was to die for. Most of all, her interest in me was utterly flattering. She could have anyone she wanted her most recent boyfriend had been an outfielder for the New York Yankees. Of all the people on earth she could be interested in, I was the one she couldn't get over. It took all of my willpower to politely decline. What helped me was that I knew in just a few hours, I'd have to answer the question from Letty would ask me whether I'd been tempted that day. After Florence left, I closed the store, went straight home, and immediately told Letty exactly what happened. I thought there would be anger, jealousy, and hysterics. Instead, she was delighted I refused and tried her best to convince me that I'd made the right choice. Four months later, Letty came home after a business trip to Atlanta. There, she went over Everpart's books with the external auditors. She told me right away that Wade Banks, the account manager of the external audit team, had propositioned her. Letty knew Wade for years and considered him a good friend. She mentioned him previously, and I knew all about him. He was an extremely attractive guy who was a young widower. Letty said that after Wade had been devastated by the death of his wife, she went out of her way to be a friend to talk to when dealing with his grief. During a dinner on the latest trip, Wade told her that he was in love with her and asked he if she would be the first woman to make love with him since the death of his wife. She admitted in shame that she was extremely tempted. The attraction to her was that she knew what a nice guy he was, and she felt an earnest desire to help him heal and move on. She said, It took a lot of willpower to say no, but I did. I knew I would have to answer questions about being tempted when I got back. I wasn't going to lie to you about it, and that helped me refuse. Following her example, rather than getting jealous or upset, I decided to reward her for her good decision. The more we practiced honesty about difficult topics, the easier it became. 
We had learned how to be honest when we were dealing with psychological trauma from her bet with Teague. We were closer than ever. I ended up selling Pa's vintage ski boat to WC. His one time in June was enough to get him totally hooked. After the third weekend he used it. I told him to just keep the boat at his house. I will confess that seeing Pa's boat always made me maudlin, and having it out of my garage was a relief. When WC felt guilty about using it so much, he made a generous offer on it. I used the money to take Letty and me on a second honeymoon to Disney. Letty had always wanted to go there. I'm not sure about the rest of the year, but for eight days in February, I can personally attest it was, in fact, the happiest place on earth. When our year was up, I was sad but thankful. On our last night, we took an overnight trip to Atlanta, and I took her out to a fancy dinner to celebrate. I wore my best suit and a tie. Letty wore her latest little black dress with her fancy red lingerie underneath. Her new little black dress was even more spectacular than the one she ruined by vomiting on it. While we were waiting for our after-dinner coffee and dessert, she visited the restroom. When she returned, I did the best I could at expressing to her what the year meant to me and how grateful I was that she gave it to me. I formally accepted her explanation from a year before. I was finishing up when she put her fingers to my lips and shushed me. She said, Andy, allowing you do what you did this year was the biggest wager of my life. You could have been abusive and made me miserable. You think you were the lucky one, but I can honestly say that I won. My gamble paid off big time. She put my forefinger on her tattoo. Just below, ride or die, it now said, forever. She leaned into me. I smelled peach cobbler. I felt something slide into my lap under the table. I put my hands down there to figure out what it was. It took me a moment to realize she'd handed me her red satin. They were soaking wet. She asked me. What do you want to bet that we can keep this going? The end. Thanks for watching. Remember, revolving time exists because of your support. So take care of yourself and see you soon with another story.